Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. We are going to give it just a few more seconds to let everybody get into the webinar, and then we will get started. Okay, as we are now about one minute after, we are gonna go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the HFMA Colorado chapter webinar series. Make sure you follow us on our, oh, sorry everybody. My slides went messed up here, there we go. Um, make sure you follow us on social media. It keeps ending, it's gonna be a day. Uh-oh, hopefully this is not a sign of things to come here. Um, let's try one more time here. All right, I'll give up if it doesn't work this time. <laughs> we do want to take a moment to recognize our annual business partners before we get started here. Their support allows us to operate our chapter and bring our members quality education and resources. We hope as always that you would take a look at our business partners first when your organization needs any services or support. We do wanna remind you as well that certification is included in your membership. So if you have ever considered or thought about getting certified, you can do so with your membership all modules are online. They can be completed on demand at a time that's convenient to you. It has never been easier to get certified. If you're interested and want more information, please contact the chapter for more details. Throughout our webinar today, please feel free to use that chat box with any questions that you may have for our presenter. I am excited. Today's webinar is brought to us by one of our annual silver sponsors, Extend Healthcare. And with that, it's my Pleasure to introduce our speaker, Melissa Caswell. Melissa has over 13 years of mid-revenue cycle experience, possessing vast knowledge of revenue cycle, medical coding, and compliance. Melissa is currently the Director of Coding Audits and Education for Extend Healthcare, responsible for the daily coding, auditing, and education operations for Extend. She also serves as a consultant to healthcare organizations across the nation. Melissa is considered a subject matter expert on professional fee, facility, and e and coding while providing auditing and education to healthcare providers and coders. Melissa holds an AHIMA certification as a certified document improvement practitioner, certified coding specialist, certified coding, coding specialist physician based, and certified Mayo Clinic Quality Academy Bronze Fellow. She is an AHIMA approved ICD-10 CM PCS trainer and actively an AHIMA volunteer and regional association speaker. So Melissa knows what she's talking about and we are so excited to have you join us. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Melissa. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for joining this session on the 2023 Evaluation and Management Coding Changes. Now that we are just getting comfortable with the 2021 E&M guidelines for office visits, the AMA and CMS have moved forward with changes to the hospital or facility evaluation and management codes. Please feel free to send any questions you may have in the chat throughout the presentation. We hope that you find the information today useful and informative. We do have a lot to cover, so let's dive in. Uh, just a little bit about my background, as Jessica mentioned, for your reference. And we will move right into the agenda today. Uh, we will cover the reasons for the 2023 E&M changes. We will have a refresher on the coding by time and medical decision making. Then we will take a look at the new codes and updated guidelines for those codes. 
I think it's always important to understand the why behind any code updates. So we'll start out by discussing the reasoning behind the changes. The AMA and CMS have been working to reduce administrative burden for providers and put patients over paperwork. The first revisions to the E&M office and other outpatient codes were made in 2019 with a major overhaul in 2021. These latest revisions are the biggest overhaul to the E&M e hospital visit codes in more than 25 years and were effective January 1st of this year. The work group feels the latest changes will produce consistency with those 2021 office visit revisions, decrease the need for audits and unnecessary documentation in the medical record, streamline E&M guidelines across multiple sites of service, thus reducing confusion, and provide a medical decision-making table that can be used for all sites. So what changed? We have a restructure of the E&M introductory guidelines, codes 99217 through 99220, were deleted for observation services and inpatient and observation codes were merged. Several changes to the consultation codes were made and major revisions to the ED e &M code set were applied. In addition, revisions were made to the nursing home codes and the domiciliary, rest home and custodial care services were deleted and are now included in the home or residence services code set. Lastly, just like we saw in 2021, we do have changes to the prolonged services codes and reporting guidelines. I will not um, have time to get into detail about those, but if you are interested in learning more about those, I have included my contact information on the last slide. CPT extends those E&M 2021 office or other outpatient guidelines to hospital consultations, ER, nursing facility, and home services. The history and physical elements of the documentation are no longer used to determine the appropriate E&M level for all services. However, appropriate documentation of the patient's history and physical examination are still necessary and very important to the patient's record. Another key change is that providers now have the choice to level the E&M based on medical decision-making or total time, except for ER services. And modifications have been made to the criteria for medical decision-making and include a revised MDM table. We'll start out talking about time. Just like in the office setting, we now have the option to level the E&M based on total time for the hospital and nursing facility services. Time is defined as the total time spent by the provider on the date of service. So not the day before, not the day after, performing qualifying activities related to that patient's visit. It does include face-to-face -face and non-face-to-face -face time on the day of the encounter, regardless of where the provider is located. The total time does not include activities the clinical staff normally perform and should not include time spent on separately billed services. Total time spent must be documented clearly by the provider, including what um, the activities what activities, what the total time spent, what they were doing. The requirement that counseling or coordination of care needing to dominate the time of the service no longer applies. The AMA has given us nine activities that qualify for counting of total time. I have grouped a couple together in this diagram. The total time spent by the provider on the date of service includes the time spent preparing to see the patient, obtaining or reviewing separately obtained history, performing a medically appropriate examination or evaluation, 
counseling and educating the patient, family, or caregiver, ordering medications, tests, or procedures, referring and communicating with other healthcare professionals, documenting in the record, interpreting results that are not separately reported by the physician or qualified healthcare professional, and communicating results to the patient, family, or caregiver, and care coordination. Notice the asterisk after independently interpreting results, care coordination, and communicating with other healthcare professionals. Do not count these activities in the total time if the physician or qualified healthcare professional is billing a separate CPT for those services. If leveling based on total time, again, documentation should state which activities were performed and counted toward the total time and that the activities were performed on the date of service. And I will also add that it should include a statement that they did not count any time on any separately billed services. So we've talked about time, now let's talk about medical decision making. Providers and coders may choose the level of service for E&M codes based on medical decision making. And I'll say this should be the majority of the time. Time is not going to be as prevalent as medical decision making for determining that E&M level. So we, have, we do have an updated medical decision making table which we will review throughout this section. Medical decision making does include establishing diagnoses, assessing the status of a condition, and selecting an appropriate management option. MDM is defined by the number and complexity of problems addressed during the encounter, the amount and complexity of data reviewed and analyzed, and the risk of complications, morbidity, and mortality of patient management decisions made at the visit as they relate to that patient's problems, diagnostic procedures, and treatments. There are still four types of medical decision-making, and these are unchanged. The types are straightforward, low, moderate, and high. And we're really looking to quantify the medical decision-making that occurred during that encounter. To support medical decision-making, we need the documentation to reflect the considerations and decisions surrounding each problem or condition addressed. Here's a snapshot of the newest MDM table. The levels of medical decision making or MDM table, this is a guide to assist in selecting the level of MDM for reporting an E&M services code. And by guide, this is not a full black and white, it is, it is just that. It is a guide to assist with making some of those decisions. The table includes the four levels of MDM and the three elements of MDM. The levels are the straightforward, low, moderate, and high, and the elements are the number and complexity of problems addressed at the encounter, the amount and complexity and or complexity of data reviewed and analyzed. And then the last column is the risk of complications and or morbidity or mortality of patient management. To qualify for a particular level of MDM, two of the three elements for that level must be met or exceeded. The AMA has developed and provided detailed definitions for each bulleted item on the table and we will review some of these definitions as we explore each level. One important element in the level of code selection is the number and complexity of the problems that are addressed at an encounter. So let's quickly review the AMA definition for this element. To qualify as a problem addressed or managed, the provider must evaluate or treat the problem. Notation in the patient's medical record that another professional is managing the problem without additional assessment or care coordination documented 
does not qualify as being addressed or managed by that physician or other qualified healthcare professional that's reporting the service. Referral without evaluation by history, exam, or diagnostic studies or consideration of treatment does not qualify as being addressed or managed by the provider reporting the service. For hospital inpatient and observation care services, the problem addressed is the problem status on the date of the encounter. This may be significantly different than what it was on admission. It is the problem being managed or co-managed by that provider who's reporting the service and again, may not be the cause of the admission or continued stay. In the second element in selecting the level of services, this is the amount and or complexity of data to be reviewed or analyzed at an encounter. This is the element that tends to be a bit more intimidating. Listed are some of the AMA definitions to assist with accurately interpreting this element. It is important to note that one should not count the reviewing and ordering of a test separately. When a test is ordered, it is expected that results be reviewed. Also, only count serial lab values as one unique test. And for the rest of the definitions related to this element, I will refer you to the AMA 2023 E&M Descriptors Guidelines. And the link to this is um, in the on the references slide. The third and final element used in selecting the level of service is that risk of complications and or morbidity or mortality of patient management at an encounter. This is distinct from the risk of the condition itself. Risk is the probability and or consequences of an event. The assessment of the level of risk is affected by the nature of the event under consideration. For the purpose of NDM, level of risk is based upon consequences of the problem or problems that were addressed at that encounter when appropriately treated. Risk also includes MDM related to the need to initiate or forego further testing, treatment, or hospitalization. The risk of patient management criteria applies to the patient management decisions made by that provider as part of that reported encounter. So I think I said that a couple times, but it's very important that um, risk is very patient specific. So it's the decisions are specific to the patient that is being treated. For example, over-the-counter medications such as aspirin may not hold the same risk for a patient who has a history of a GI bleed as one who does not have a bleeding history. So for straightforward MDM, the number and complexity of problems addressed, you may have one self-limited or minor problem. The AMA has used the example of a problem that they probably didn't need to come into the office or they wouldn't be hospitalized for and could have been treated at home. The amount or complexity of data reviewed and analyzed may be minimal or none and minimal risk of morbidity from additional diagnostic testing or treatment may exist. In other words, minimal risk from treatment, including no treatment or testing, and most would consider this effectively as no risk. For low medical decision-making, under number and complexity of problems addressed, you may have two or more self-limited or minor problems, or one stable chronic illness, or one acute uncomplicated illness or injury. And newly added for 2023, you have one stable acute illness, or one acute uncomplicated illness or injury, requiring hospital or observation level of care. Definitions are provided for the type of problems addressed, a stable chronic illness, this is defined as it relates to the patient's specific treatment goals. A patient who is not at his or her treatment goal is not stable. Even if the condition has not changed, 
and there is no short-term threat to life or function. For example, a patient with persistently poorly controlled blood pressure for whom better control is a goal is not stable, even if the pressures are not changing and the patient is asymptomatic because the risk of morbidity without treatment is significant. In acute, uncomplicated illness or injury, this is a recent or new short-term problem with low risk of morbidity for which treatment is considered. There is little to no risk of mortality with treatment and full recovery without functional impairment is expected. Also, a problem that is normally self-limited or minor, but is not resolving consistent with a definite and prescribed course, that would be an acute uncomplicated illness. And then we have a stable acute illness, and this is a problem that is new or recent for which treatment has been initiated. Um, the patient is improved, and while resolution may not be complete, they are stable with respect to the condition. And acute uncomplicated illness or injury requiring hospital observation level of care. This is new for this year, and this is a recent or new short-term problem with low risk of morbidity for which treatment is required. Again, there is little to no risk of mortality with treatment and full recovery without functional impairment is expected. But the difference is the treatment required is delivered in a hospital inpatient or observation level setting. So this is what you would look at a problem when the patient has been in the hospital, being seen on subsequent visits and rounding, and they are now stable and they're that as it relates to that specific condition, that would fall under this, this newly added bullet, this last one. If they are not, um, they're, they're considered stable, they're not changing, they're not worsening, they're getting better, and they are pretty much at, at goal, but you're continuing to monitor that. Beginning with this level though, the data element is expanded into categories. In order to qualify as limited data reviewed and analyzed, the requirements of at least one of the two categories must be met. Category one is for tests and documents and includes any combination of two from the following. Review of prior external notes from each unique source. Review of the results from each unique test or ordering of each unique test. And again, if a provider orders a test at the visit and reviews that test at a subsequent visit, only count the ordering at the initial visit because when a test is ordered, it is inclusive or expected that the test be reviewed or results shared with the patient. Category two is the assessment requiring an independent historian. And then, low risk of morbidity from additional diagnostic testing or treatment may exist. Per the AMA, low risk means just a very low risk of anything bad happening. Typically, you would have minimal consent and discussion occurring with low risk. The AMA has purposely not provided examples of low risk as they believe this should be based on the clinical judgment and risk to that specific patient. With the moderate level of MDM, we do see the table expand quite a bit. Under the problems addressed, we now have a chronic illness with exacerbation, progression, or side effects of treatment, two or more stable chronic illnesses, one undiagnosed new problem with uncertain prognosis, one acute illness with systemic symptoms, and one acute complicated injury. Then the data element is expanded into three categories. And you'll need to meet the requirements for at least one of those three categories. Again, we have category one for tests and documents and any combination of three from the following, which is that review of prior external notes from each unique source, review of the results from the each unique test and the ordering of the each unique test, and now they've moved up the assessment requiring an independent historian from category two from the previous level to category one. 
And then category two in this level is the independent interpretation of tests that are not separately reported. Category three is the discussion of management or test interpretation with an external physician that is not separately reported. And then moderate risk of morbidity from additional diagnostic testing or treatment may exist. And there are some examples provided, but keep in mind, these are only examples. I will add for prescription drug management, this is counted as long as the documentation supports prescription drug management was considered within the medical decision making. So the decision to start a new med, continue current meds, discontinue a medication in relation to a problem address, that is counted. The key here is the documented relationship. For the surgery examples, it is important to document the specific patient or procedure risk factors as they relate to that decision of surgery. Then last, we have social determinants of health. Um, these become moderate risk when the documentation links the issue with the problem addressed. So I, I know we can code diagnosis codes for all of these social determinants that we're hearing about now, but in order for that to be considered into the medical decision-making to determine that e &M level, the provider must document the significance. So why is that social determinant of significance and how does that increase risk of patient management? Further clarification is provided in the definitions of the elements described in the previous slide. A chronic illness that is acutely worsening, poorly controlled, or progressing with an intent to control the pro progression that does require additional care or attention to treatment for side effects, but it doesn't require hospitalization, this would be a chronic illness with exacerbation. An undiagnosed new problem with uncertain prognosis is a problem in the differential diagnosis that represents a condition likely to result in a high risk of morbidity if it were not to be treated. One example may be a lump in the breast, and the key here is that differential diagnosis, though. So the lump may be benign or it may be breast cancer. Acute illnesses with symptoms affecting one or more organ systems also have a high risk of morbidity without treatment and do not include systemic general symptoms that may be treated to alleviate symptoms. Examples are acute illnesses with um, systemic symptoms. These may include pyelonephritis, pneumonitis, and colitis. In acute complicated injury, uh, this includes evaluation of body systems not directly part of that injured organ. Um, it's extensive or treatment options are multiple and are associated with risk of morbidity. An example may be a head injury with brief loss of consciousness. This slide shows the definitions of the additional elements that could impact moderate medical decision making. Note an external physician is an individual who is not in the same group practice or is a different specialty or subspecialty. Independent interpretation. This should not be used for medical decision making selection when the physician or other qualified healthcare professional has or is reporting the interpretation separately from the e &M. This includes if the test has been or will be interpreted by a physician within that same group practice and specialty. Um, this independent interpretation would be for actually reviewing the images, not someone else's report. So documentation should state actual images were reviewed if the images were reviewed. An appropriate source includes professionals who are not healthcare professionals, but may be involved in the management of the patient, uh, such as a parole officer or a social worker. 
And then your social determinants of health that I spoke about, those are economic and social conditions that influence the health of people and communities and are very important to capture. We're hearing more and more about those um, every week, actually, but the last, um, especially the last couple of years, uh, they've become a hot topic. So some examples maybe include food or housing insecurity, um, transportation, if they have trouble getting to appointments, we're looking for documentation to capture those not only as diagnoses, but then if they have a significance to the, the patient being treated appropriately and how do they relate to that medical decision-making in that specific encounter. For high medical decision-making, uh, the problems addressed may be one or more chronic illnesses with severe exacerbation, progression, or side effects of treatment, or one acute or chronic illness or injury that poses a threat to life or bodily function. The data element is extensive and includes the same three categories as the level four moderate MDM, but instead of meeting one out of three categories, you must meet the requirements of at least two out of three categories. High risk of morbidity from additional diagnostic testing or treatment may exist. And you can see the examples the AMA provided. Um, and there are two additions for 2023 highlighted here. So um, one of those being escalation of hospital level of care. So if a patient is the decision, the patient is already hospitalized and the status changes with the patient and they are needed um, to be admitted, moved over to ICU or CCU, uh, that would qualify as high risk of morbidity decision um, because of that decision to escalate hospital level of care. <clears throat> with chronic illness with severe exacerbation, progression or side effects of treatment, there is a significant risk of morbidity and the patient may require that escalation and level of care. And I say may because all of the things in the risk, that last column of risk, um, if, they, if they, the patient decides they don't want to go with that treatment or the ultimate decision is, okay, we're not going to do that, but the consideration of that is well documented, that would still fall under that category of risk. For acute or chronic illness or injury that poses a threat to life or bodily function, there is a near-term threat to life or bodily function without treatment. In acute illness with systemic symptoms and acute complicated injury or a chronic illness or injury with exacerbation and or progression of, or side effects of treatment may be involved. Examples may include acute MI, pulmonary embolus, and severe respiratory distress. And then we have the drug therapy requiring intensive monitoring for toxicity. This definition is quite lengthy. Just some points to remember. The drug should be therapeutic and has the potential to cause serious morbidity or death. Monitoring is done to assess adverse effects rather than effectiveness. The type of monitoring used should be the generally accepted kind for that agent. Although you could have patient-specific monitoring as well, long-term or short-term monitoring is okay and long-term monitoring would occur at least quarterly. Lab imaging and physiologic tests, these are possible monitoring methods. So monitoring is not history and exam. It is actually doing tests, some sort of additional tests to monitor for toxicity. It does affect the MDM level when the provider considers the monitoring as part of that patient management. An example of drug therapy requiring intensive monitoring for toxicity is testing for cytopenia between antimioplastic agent dose cycles. 
Okay, so now that we know how to come up with that level, um, all of the new codes, we're going to discuss the new codes for 2023 and those changes. So we'll start off by taking a look at the new codes for inpatient and observation services. Inpatient and observation care codes have now merged because the AMA felt the physician work was the same for inpatient and observation, which makes sense. These codes are used to report initial and subsequent evaluation and management services provided to hospital inpatients and to patients designated as hospital outpatient or what we call observation status. Hospital inpatient or observation care codes are also used to report partial hospitalization services. For patients designated or admitted as observation status in a hospital, it is not necessary that the patient be located in an observation area in a separate spot that is designated by the hospital. If such an area does exist in a hospital as a separate unit, um, such even in the emergency department, these codes may be utilized if the, place, the patient is placed in such an area, whether or not they are in the area. Total time on the date of the encounter is by calendar date. When using MDM or total time for code selection, a continuous service that spans the transition of two calendar dates is considered a single service and is only reported on one calendar date. If the service is continuous before and through midnight, all the time may be applied to the reported date of service. These codes are used to report the first hospital inpatient or observation status encounter with the patient. An initial service may be reported when the patient has not received any professional services from the physician or other qualified healthcare professional or another provider of the exact same specialty and subspecialty who belongs to the same group practice during the stay. When advanced practice nurses and physician assistants are working with physicians, they are considered as working in the exact same specialty and subspecialty as the physician. And this was really clarified um, this year. For the purpose of reporting an initial hospital inpatient or observation care service, a transition from observation level to inpatient also does not constitute a, a new stay. Another good clarification this year. And subsequent hospital inpatient or observation care. Again, um, you do have the option to choose the level based on documented medical decision-making or total time according to the listed time threshold. And you can see um, that there are three levels. Well, there's three codes and straightforward and low fall into the 99231. And then the 32 is for moderate and the 33 being for high. And next we have the codes for an inpatient or observation patient that was admitted and discharged on the same date of service. Keep in mind, CMS guidelines are that the patient has to be in the facility for eight hours in order to use these codes. These codes do require documentation of two or more encounters. If there is not documentation of two or more encounters, then only the initial care code would be used. This means that the patient must have been seen twice that day and there must be an initial note and a discharge note. And then there were no changes to the discharge day management codes other than to confirm these codes are to be used by the admitting or attending physician and that other providers should use the subsequent care codes even if the service is performed on the date of discharge. Discharge day management service time reported is based on the time spent 
on the date of the encounter. The requirement that the time reported by the, um, the time be the time spent on the date of the encounter as opposed to any accumulated time before the encounter date, this is a change from guidelines issued prior to 2023. Moving on to consultation codes, both the outpatient and inpatient consultation codes have gone undergone revisions for 2023 to unify and improve the coding structure. Codes 99241 and 99251 have been deleted to align with the four levels of MDM. The basic principle of consultation codes is a request for an opinion from another provider. Uh, they did delete a confusing guideline of transfer of care, uh, but the advisor opinion guideline is still there. Inpatient observation consultations, the, they will use, utilize the same, the same codes. The code level can be selected either on MDM or total time. And total time must be on the date of the encounter. Keep in mind though that Medicare and some other payers do not recognize or pay consultation codes. So you wanna make sure that you know which payers actually accept those in order to avoid a claim denial. Codes 99242 through 99245, these are used in the office or other outpatient site. Uh, these include the home or residence or emergency department. Codes 99252, 53, 54, and 55, these are used to report the physician or other qualified healthcare professional consultations provided to hospital inpatients, observation level patients, residents of nursing facilities, or patients in a partial hospital setting. And only when the patient has not received any face-to-face -face professional services from the provider or another provider of that exact same specialty and subspecialty that belong to the same group practice during that stay. So, only one consultation may be reported by a consultant per admission. Subsequent consultation services during the same admission are reported using subsequent inpatient or observation hospital care codes or the subsequent nursing facility care codes. Moving on to emergency department services. The ER MDM levels have been modified. The code structure is made similar to the office visit codes now. Each ER level of service now has a unique MDM level. The AMA changed the guidelines to state critical care may be reported in addition to an ED service if clinical change occurs after the ED ENM. Um, really waiting to see if payers are going to actually pay that, agree with that. Uh, CMS has not changed anything on that, and the CMS guidelines still state when an ED patient requires critical care services, only the critical care codes may, re may be reported as an E&M service. An ED visit code E&M may not also be reported by the same provider or another provider of the same group on the same day as critical care service. Unlike other ENM services, ED services cannot be coded by time. Time is not a descriptive component for the emergency department levels of ENM because ER services are typically provided on a variable intensity basis often involving multiple encounters with several patients over an extended period of time. Here you can see the 2023 MDM levels for each code compared to the 2022 MDM levels. For 2023, 99281 has been updated from straightforward MDM 
to a level that may not require a physician or qualified healthcare physician provider. 99282 was changed from low to straightforward. 99283 is now low instead of moderate. And that is the biggest change. You can see that 99283 and four were both moderate which didn't make much, much sense to me, um, it caused some confusion and a gray area in what's a level three and what's a level four. So 99284 remained at moderate and your level five is high. Moving on to nursing facility services. Initial nursing facility care codes 99304 through 99306, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> may be used once per admission per physician or other qualified healthcare professional, regardless of length of stay. They may be used for the initial comprehensive visit performed by the principal physician or other qualified healthcare professional. Skilled nursing facility initial comprehensive visits must be performed by a physician. Qualified healthcare professionals may report initial comprehensive nursing facility visits for those nursing facility level of care patients if allowed by state law or regulation. The principal physician or other QHC may work with others um, who may not always be in the same group, but they are overseeing the overall medical care of the patient in order to provide that timely care to the patient. And then medically necessary assessments conducted by those professionals is if they're prior to that initial comprehensive visit, those would be reported using subsequent care codes, which are on the next slide. Uh, another thing to note about these is for reporting the initial nursing facility care Transitions between skilled nursing facility level of care and just nursing facility level of care, um, sometimes you have the, that status bouncing back and forth, that does not constitute a new stay. So if they go from skilled to non-skilled and back, they don't get an initial each time. And we have the subsequent nursing facility care codes shown on this slide, the 99307 to 99310. There are four separate levels in unique codes for each level, along with the time thresholds. And then we have CPT codes 99315 and 99316. These are used to report the total duration of time on the date of the encounter spent by that provider for the final nursing facility discharge of a patient. The codes include as appropriate any final examination of the patient, discussion of the nursing facility stay, um, even if the time spent on that date is not continuous. Oftentimes instructions are given for continuing care to the relevant caregivers, um, preparation of discharge records, prescriptions, referrals. These services um, do require a face-to-face -face encounter with the patient and or family or caregiver, but that face-to-face -face encounter may be performed on a date prior to the date that the patient leaves the facility. So it doesn't have to be on their last day. Code selection is based on the total time on the date of the discharge management face-to-face -face encounter. Lastly, we have home or residence services. Codes 99341 through 99345 and 99347 through 99350. These are used to report e &M services provided in a home or residence. 99341 through the 99345 on this slide are for new patients. So new versus established patient. Um, 99347 through 350 are for established patients. On the next slide, we'll look at those. The home may be defined as a private residence, temporary lodging, 
or short-term accommodation such as a hotel, campground, hostel, or cruise ship. These codes are also used when the residence is an assisted living facility. So that is a big change. I know um, since the pandemic started, a lot of visits out to assisted living have been happening, group homes, things like that. All of those code um, places of service will now be in these code sets. And so the old codes no longer apply, were deleted. So if you're still using those, those claims are being, should be being denied because that code is no longer. When selecting a code level using time, you wanna make sure that you do not count any travel time. And I will recommend um, because CMS had put out an announcement already um, a couple weeks ago and said that they will be basically scrutinizing time. So um, not, we, not only listing the time in the documentation, but what did that time include or exclude? And I would recommend if you're billing this based on time and not the MDM to get that higher level that, uh, that is clear that it does not include any travel time. Because I know there is, could be a significant amount of travel time, especially in rural areas but they will not allow that time to be counted. And here are the established patient codes with level of MDM and time thresholds for your reference. And to close, because I know there's quite a few questions, um, I just have some tips on documentation elements to look for um, to help with determining that level of medical decision making. You'll want to look for problems addressed and how they were addressed. Any tests ordered and workup for each problem. Any conditions, tests, and treatment options that were considered, even though they may have not been established or performed. Documentation should be patient specific and include any specific patient risk factors for treatment or management options. Any external notes reviewed in discussions with other parties, we'll be looking for that information. And lastly, each diagnosis listed in the impression or final diagnoses should have a documented corresponding assessment and plan. So this slide has the resources. Um, the second uh, link here goes straight to every single definition that the AMA has provided us with. Um, then the last slide is my contact information. And I certainly don't mind um, if you know you have questions or like I said, we didn't have time to include the prolonged services. If you, if you would like to reach out with some general questions, I'd be happy to answer those. And if you're looking for more detailed information because I could I could talk about E and M for for two hours here. But if you're looking for more detailed information for your coding teams or your providers, um, certainly reach out. We would be happy to discuss that further. So I am going to maybe stop sharing so I can get the chat here. Thanks, Melissa. Um, while you're doing that, I did see one, one question come in, but a lot of the questions were more in reference to will the presentation be available and stuff like that. Um, so I just want to let everyone know the presentation is available. If you open that chat box um, and scroll all the way to the top, there are a couple different ways for you to access it. it. You should be able to open it and download it and save it from there. A little bit further down in that chat box, I also dropped in a link that'll take you to um, the presentation as well, where you'd be able to save. Lastly, I will send out a, an email to everyone who's on the uh, presentation today with links to the survey, which we would really appreciate you completing. Um, and with that, I will also send the presentation as well. We will also have a, record, uh, a link to the recording made available to everyone as well. Um, and certificates. We'll also have certificates once uh, we get those surveys and stuff out. Jessica, I, I do have a question. Um, I noticed on the, the roster, I don't know if 
um, anyone attended, but if anyone is looking for an AHIMA CEU because they have an AHIMA coding credential, um, if the, you can share the attendance list and I can verify that they were in attendance, I, I can certainly provide that to them if they reach out to me because this, this webinar was also approved for one AHIMA CEU. That's excellent, awesome. So um, for anyone interested, that would be great. Uh, let me know and I will get that info over to Melissa. So I do see, uh, Kathy, I see that you have requested that AHIMA, which is great. Kathy, can you pop into that chat your last name so I make sure I get the right person over there? Um, AAPC CEU, we do not have that. Um, that certification. Um, but we do have, great, we have a few people who want that AHIMA. So I will make sure all of that information goes over there. Um, and then also for those of you who had requested the NASBA CPE, we will have that as well. Uh, I do, I'm gonna scroll up and we can address this question while people are popping in there, their requests for AHIMA, et cetera. And if anybody has any other additional questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat. But we did have a question. Yep. Um, a few slides back that was for the discharge codes, if a provider sees a patient early in the day and then a different on-call provider discharges that patient, are both EMs billable by each provider or should they be combined and billed under the physician that discharged the patient? So it would not, you would not be, if you're going to bill the admin same day discharge, it would need to be billed just under one, assuming that they're probably both the same specialty. Um, they may both be hospitalist or family practice, depending on the size of the hospital. Then only one provider could bill for that visit, but you could combine all of the notes. And I recommend giving the credit to the provider who has done the bulk of the work. Excellent, thanks. Just double check in our Q&A box here too. It looks like that's a, all I am seeing right now. So I just wanna take this moment to thank Melissa for being here for us. We really appreciate it. Oh, there was a follow-up here. Okay, so um, if it's not a same day admit and discharge. So let's say the two people saw the patient on the day of discharge. The other providers can bill a subsequent EM. So if the, if another provider besides the attending saw the patient on the day of discharge, subsequent EM. Yes. And I forgot to mention um, each each day I'm getting more and more questions about this, but because of that, this, the inpatient observation care codes, I think is one of the most significant changes. And the, now the only differentiation for the payer to know if they were inpatient or observation status is that place of service being reported on the claim. It is very important that you have the correct place of service, whether it be outpatient, hospital outpatient or inpatient, 21 or 22, um, still connected to that code. So now that they use the same codes, um, I believe most, if not all of the MACs, initially denied the observation ones because they did not have their systems updated. I also have saw um, Cigna and Humana, they did not update their systems. I'm still going through denials from all of January, no claims paid for observation EM visits. So check, check your denials, be looking for those denials, following up with the payers, reaching out to them and reminding them that we have new codes that were effective January 1, and they will not see that they are qualified codes and make sure that you have the correct 22 or 21 place of service, depending on that patient status on that claim. It's creating a lot of work for everyone.
Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. We really appreciate you being here and sharing this very important information with us. Um, lastly, I do want to let everyone here know that we have our spring symposium coming up in April, and we would love to see you all there. There are lots of ways to get there. Um, if you've got full teams or anything coming, uh, we've got some discounts for groups. Uh, and and some other item or ways as well to get there. So we would love to see you all in April. With that, we'll let everybody uh, get back. Thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye.